Hello and welcome to our PCS Facebook Live event. A uh, very warm welcome to everybody who's joining us and just to a big thanks in advance to Richard, our interpreter, who is going to be making sure that the event is as accessible as possible. Um, people will know that the main reason for calling this, this meeting tonight is to allow as many people as possible to ask questions and comments about the decisions that PCS National Executive Committee took at their meeting on the 13th and 14th of July, and that was to move to a statutory ballot uh, to run from the 26th of September to the 7th of November. So clearly there's lots and lots of information we want to give you about the rationale behind the decision, how it's come about, what the issues are, why it's so important that everybody is engaged in all of this. And in a minute, I'm going to hand over to our General Secretary, Mark Swatka, to take us through all of that. But what we also want to make sure we do is allow plenty of time for questions, comments and contributions that anybody has. So if you have a question that you um, would like to raise, don't send it to me directly if you have my contact details because I won't get it. Uh, put it in the chat. It will be picked up by one of our admins and then the, ad and, and the admin will pass those messages to me and I'll make sure we get through as many questions and comments as we can. Just a reminder though, when you put in messages in the chat, it would be really helpful if you say who you are. So if your um, device is down as, Samsung 5, it would be much more helpful if we, we had your name and the department that you work in, just so we've got some idea uh, in terms of the way we're best answering as many questions as possible. As I say, we, we took the decision on the 13th and 14th of, of July. Lots and lots of work is going on throughout PCS to uh, build momentum for what's coming. But clearly, um, whilst it may seem a little way off, there's a stack of work that we all need to be doing between now and, and the ballot going live. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mark. Mark will talk us through everything that's happened today and what, what is happening, um, give you a bit of an update about the discussions that we've been involved in. And as I say, plenty of time for you to raise questions and comments. So if you want to put them in the chat, start doing that now if you've got questions lined up, and then we'll gather as many of those and I'll get through them as, as best I can. So without any further ado, over to you, Mark. Well, good evening, everybody, um, and thanks ever so much for joining us, and, and also a big thanks to Richard for, for once again uh, assisting us tonight. Um, the first thing I wanted to get across, Fran, is, is just to remind those who are, are watching how we got to where we are. Uh, people will remember that earlier on in the year, we had a consultative ballot of all of our members asking people whether they supported the union putting in a 10% across the board pay claim with a £15 an hour minimum wage and a move towards national bargaining. And we also asked whether people would be prepared to support industrial action in the event that we made no headway to the, with the government. Now, people will recall that at the time we did that, our case was that if we didn't have a 10% pay rise, we would see this year the single biggest cost of living decrease any of us will have ever seen since records began, in fact, that if we didn't persuade the government or show them that we meant business, we would not just see a huge cut in our cost of living, but potentially we would also see other huge detriments, including to the way our pensions are paid for and potentially our redundancy arrangements. In that consultative ballot, people voted massively to support a 10% pay claim, the highest endorsement we'd ever had, um, nearly 98%. People also voted by well over 80% that they would be prepared to support industrial action. And the turnout in that ballot was 45%. We said at the time that those figures sent a very strong message to the government, and we would do everything we could to meet ministers and the senior civil servants to try to persuade them to do the right thing. Well, as we've all seen since that time, things have not got better, they've got worse. Government ministers have refused to meet the union. That's fairly unheard of, even through some of the darkest times in the civil service ministers have been prepared to meet the union, even if it's to tell us that they're not going to change their mind. You know, recently, we've seen the unprecedented situation where they not only won't meet us, but they don't even reply to our letters. Instead, they fielded senior civil servants, and those civil servants have told us that far from giving us a 10% pay rise, the civil service and all related areas will have a pay remit that will pay an average 2% increase this year. That has now been confirmed is amongst the lowest of any of our public sector colleagues. 
In addition to telling us that we're only getting 2%, We've now seen inflation rise massively. Since our indicative ballot, when inflation was running at 7%, it is now running at close to 11% and forecasted to go higher. So in real terms, if you get a 2% pay rise this year, you will lose 9% in real terms in your living standards. So things have got a lot worse and the government are refusing to budge on giving us more money. But that situation is also worse because since we've started talking about campaigning, the government has made pay awards to the rest of the public sector, to nurses, doctors, um, and to teachers, for example. And in those cases, the pay review bodies are awarding, on average, pay rises of 5%. Now, all of those unions have rejected 5%. 5% clearly is half the rate of inflation and is nowhere near good enough, but it's twice as much as we're being offered. And what that confirms in very brutal terms, is the government once again this year intends to make civil servants, PCS members and people in related bodies treated worse than any other part of the public sector. So for all those reasons, on the question of pay, things are now more serious now than when they were when we did the indicative ballot. But they've also got worse in another way. The government, since we've started trying to raise these issues centrally, have written to us to confirm that even though they know we are paying too much for our pension, if you're in the civil service pension scheme, by 2% each month, they are not going to give that back. They're going to carry on making you pay 2% each month more than you should. We've launched legal action, and I can confirm tonight that we will have a five-day high court hearing, but it isn't going to be until early in 2023 because of the delays in the justice system. We hope to win that legal case, but we also need to ensure though given it's a year away, we make that very much central to our demands. And imagine if on top of a pay rise, we were also getting you your 2% pension contributions back and backdated to April 2019. It would make a significant difference to members' pay packets and to your families. But things have also got worse in this sense. Without any consultation, as most of you will know, Boris Johnson, as one of his final acts before he was ousted as a Conservative Party leader, announced that 91,000 jobs would be cut from the civil service and they would be cut by the 1st of April 2025. At the same time, the government has written to the union to confirm that they want to reduce our redundancy pay by up to 33%, something they tried to do in 2016 when we defeated them and stopped it in the High Court. And if you take a combination of those four issues, there is no other worker in Britain, and specifically in the public sector, who faces what you face. You face a 9% cut in your living standards in real terms. Only this week, we were told that average energy prices would probably go up to £3,800 per home. You face being forced to continue to pay 2% more for your pension than the government knows you should. One in five of your jobs or your colleagues' jobs will go, meaning 91,000 people could lose their job, and those who do not lose their job will be forced to work in much more stressful conditions, and the government is going to try and get rid of those jobs on the cheap by cutting your redundancy pay by up to 33%. Now, that is an attack on you that has never been seen before. We've seen most of these things before in one form or another, never all at the same time, and never with the severity that we're now seeing them. And they are not issues faced by anyone else. Now, for those who've been unfortunate enough to follow the Conservative leadership campaign, you can also see that Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak, not content with all of those issues that you face, are also talking about getting even tougher. This week, Liz Truss announced she wants to introduce regional pay to reduce the pay of civil servants outside of London. She made it clear she wants to scrap all diversity and inclusion posts, she wants to do away with all trade union facility time, meaning that you won't have reps who can represent you in the workplace. And Liz Truss has confirmed that within 30 days of becoming prime minister, she intends to tighten the anti-union laws, meaning it will be even harder for unions like ours to lawfully take industrial action, forcing us to give more notice if industrial action is going to be taken and potentially increasing not just to 50% needing to vote in ballots, but that 50% of all members must also vote yes. So colleagues, I hope what people can see is faced with all of this, your leadership of the union 
realized that having had a debate at our conference in May, where reps from around the union gathered in Brighton, we had no choice but to move to a statutory industrial action ballot. And even though we're trying, through legal action, through negotiations with senior civil servants, everything tells us that unless we can win the industrial action ballot that we've called for the end of September, then we are going to see a massive attack on our jobs and our pay and our conditions. So we haven't just been sitting back calling an industrial action ballot though, as Fran indicated, we've been very busy, not just trying to raise our case with the media, with politicians and with management, but we've also been talking to our colleagues in other public sector unions. And I can announce tonight that those talks are going very, very well. And they confirm why our decision to ballot in September rather than ballot now is absolutely the right one. We chose to ballot in September because we know that we cannot afford to run the risk of not getting over a 50% turnout in the ballot, because if we do that, no matter how many people vote to strike, we would have no legal ability to take industrial action. If we end up in that situation, we will see a cut in living standards, jobs and our pensions. So we chose September because we know there's a lot of work to be done to get more people to join the union, to get more people to ensure that we've got all updated records, that people are using our digital tools and are engaging with the union to mean that when we ballot, we smash the 50% requirement. We should all remember that we've tried in recent years twice to have statutory ballots and came very close to winning, once with a 47.7% turnout and once with a 42% turnout. In both cases, the votes for strike action were enormous. They were nearly 80%. But the law says if you do not get 50% plus one voting, you cannot do anything. So September, we feel, is the best chance to give us the summer to make sure all the work is done to produce a massive yes vote. But September also is now the right time to ballot because we've been talking to our colleagues in other unions. And I can confirm that those talks are now making it clear that our colleagues in the health service, our colleagues in the teaching unions, in the education unions, in higher and further education, our colleagues in local government, right across the public sector, probably including the fire brigades union and many others are all now either deciding to ballot in the autumn or are currently consulting their representatives about ballots in the autumn. So when we get to September, it will not just be us alone. We are likely to be one of many unions in the public sector moving to ballots. Of course, already we will have seen in recent weeks, the RMT have taken industrial action and got massive media coverage. The train drivers union, ASLEF, the communication workers union, both with the postal services and with BT engineers, our colleagues in the universities have all been taking significant amounts of industrial action. And most of our public sector colleagues are lining up alongside us to join that in the autumn itself. So Fran, what I wanted to finish on really is, is, is the sort of practicalities of what we now need to do and what is at stake. It's clear from anyone who's been watching that the point about the civil service being bottom of the government's priority list has already been proven by the way they've treated us. But if you need definitive proof, just think of this. The pay review body that determines pay for senior civil servants is the only pay review body report that the government did not accept in full. They accepted the recommendation for teachers, accepted the recommendation for health workers, not enough, but they accepted the 5% recommendation. In the civil service, they refused to accept the recommendation and have told the senior civil service that like us, they must get 2%. It's further proof that we are always bottom of the government's priority list. So what we now need to imagine is getting into the autumn, when the fuel bills are arriving, when things are getting worse, and when the government starts its plans to try and cut jobs, for us to have any hope of getting more money, better pensions, and stopping the job cuts, and stopping the redundancy cuts, we have to win this ballot and be in a position to negotiate with them, with them knowing we can call industrial action. It's even more important that we're in a position to do that because it is likely that most other public sector unions will do the same thing. And it stands to reason, if teachers have voted to take industrial action and we haven't, any compromise that the government makes will be given to teachers and it will not be given to civil servants. So it is without doubt in our view, this is the most important ballot we have ever had in this union's history. Important because of what the government's trying to do to us, 
important because of the cost of living crisis, that when we did a survey recently, 12,000 members responded within one week and members were telling us that a thousand of them regularly use food banks. If replicated across the whole of our membership, it means 8% of PCS members are regularly using food banks. Members told us that some of them were so poor that they couldn't afford the travel to get to work. And in some cases had to call in sick or take annual leave. Members are telling us in their thousands that many of them are skipping meals because they literally cannot afford to make ends meet and all of that, of course, is going to get worse. So our appeal across the whole of the union is what we now have to do, every one of us, whether you are a member in a workplace of 5,000 people or in a workplace of 10 people, it is to ensure that when these ballots land in September, that we return the biggest possible yes vote and that we ensure that we smash the 50% threshold. If we do not achieve that in the coming weeks and months, we will be uniquely exposed to the biggest cuts and attacks that we will ever have seen. However, if we do win the ballots, if we do get over the 50% threshold, then what we want people to know is that we're not planning a protest. We're not planning to say to the government, oh, please, will you do a bit better? We will go to them and we will tell them that having won those ballots, they should now negotiate with us and do better. But if they don't, we believe that with this position that we're currently in, we have the ability to call the type of industrial action that could have the most enormous effect on government operations. That would be every bit as impactful and effective as RMT members and train drivers stopping public transport. We have members who, if they are not at work, can stop some of the most vital functions in this country. So we are not planning a protest. We are planning for the government to take us seriously and planning a campaign that will maximize the pressure on them to ensure they do the right thing. And ultimately the right thing is to give you a pay rise so you are not worse off, give you the money back they've robbed you from your pension since April 2019, not cut 91,000 jobs and not cut our redundancy terms. So it's now over to us. So whilst there'll be many questions, Fran, my appeal on behalf um, of the National Executive Committee is if you believe you cannot afford to be treated this way, if you support this ballot, is to now ensure that you talk to your colleagues, try to get people to join the union who are not in the union, make sure we've got your up-to-date ballot address and personal email and contact details, because this ballot will have to be run by post. And we have already seen from some employers this week, they're already clamping down, trying to stop the union communicating at work and stopping our reps talking to you about the issues in this ballot. So they're gonna make it tough for us. So what we have to do is make sure we can contact you, you come to our meetings and events, you update your personal details, but talk to your colleagues at work. If we do all of that, we can get to the end of this ballot period, win the ballot right across all of our membership areas, smash the threshold and believe that we can do better. But if we don't get over the ballot threshold, we are going to suffer for many years to come. So I hope with that we can unite, ensure that we win the ballot, and then ensure that PCS members are treated in the way that you should be deserving of, given the vital work that you do. So we hope from that you understand why the executive has called the ballot, why it is so important, and the questions we have tonight can set us down the path of ensuring that all of us can do everything we can to ensure we can look the government in the eye in the autumn and get what you deserve. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Mark, and hopefully people have found that useful as background to uh, where, where we are. I'm going to start with a few solidarity shout outs, and there's actually quite a lot of them, so I'll, get, I'll rattle through a few. Solidarity from DWP West Wales Branch, it's time for change. Solidarity from DWP T TAF. Solidarity from East Kilbride HMRC. D DWP Durham House. HMRC Glasgow. Northern Ireland HMRC Branch. Good luck, comrades, moving forward. Solidarity from Revenue and Customs Wales. Solidarity from the asylum operations in Merseyside, from Martin Cavanagh on behalf of the DWP group to everyone in the union. It's never been more important to win a ballot with so much at stake, but collectively we can do this. From Tracy Hilton, Revenue and Customs uh, Merseyside and, and NEC member, Solidarity, DWPT's Valley Branch, PCS Scotland Committee, Scottish Government Leith Branch, Dundee Pension Centre, keep up the amazing work. Solidarity from the Independent Office of Police Conduct. 
DDP Liverpool branch, and I think that's probably enough to be going on with. But um, if you want, to, want me to read out more solidarity messages, just stick them in the chat and I'll rattle through some more at the appropriate time. OK, so we've got lots and lots of questions coming through, all sorts of questions. Um, Mark, I haven't had time to sort of shuffle them into any appropriate order, so I'm just going to give you them as, as they're coming through. So Fina asks, my members are asking how many, what, what I'll do just for clarity, I'll probably read four or five questions out, ask Mark to respond, see where that takes us and, the, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next batch of questions rather than, you know, end up with 30 or 40 questions from Mark to attempt to respond to. If we do them in batches of about five, that will hopefully get us through a lot of what's been sent in. So Fina asks, my members are asking how many days of strike action are we planning and will it be followed up by a period of work to rule? Uh, Lee asks, when will the membership database be finalised and sent for ballot papers to be prepared? In other words, how long do members have to update their details before the ballot uh, opens? Lee, if I can just answer that one quickly, because it, it might save a lot of time in terms of the things that Mark needs to focus on. The final date that everything gets sent to Civica, which is the company we use for the ballot, is the 5th of September. Uh, so the cutoff date for reps and branches to send their their update all the details for all of their members is the 3rd of September. It's the 3rd of August today. So we've got exactly one month to do this and to make sure the records are absolutely as accurate as possible. Obviously, after the 5th of September, we would still urge you to continue to, to do that work throughout the ballot. Obviously, it can only improve things if we get the membership data as accurate as possible. Um, but, but clearly, the more that can be done by the 5th of September, the more that that's the absolute cut off for the data that goes into the ballot. OK, so we've had Fina's question. We've had Lee's question. Julie asks, what can be done if more than half the members don't bother to vote? Uh, Michael asks, what can be done for, th for those members who are only using PCS as an insurance policy? They're impacting on the rest of us. Um, and Gordon says the 45% turnout in the consultative ballot sends a message to the government that less than half of the membership cared about these issues to even bother to reply. This lack of turnout amazes me. Words fail me, to be honest. Why do you think our turnouts repeatedly fail to reach 50% time after time? And what can we do differently? So, Mark, there's quite a lot there. I recognise that, you know, um, we started with Fina's question around um, how many mem how many days people will be asked to act to, to take and uh, will, will it be followed by work to rule? But also... Um, Judy's points about what what can we do if half the members, more than half the members, don't bother to vote, and and obviously Gordon made that quite clear in terms of his, his question. Uh, so I don't know if you want to start by coming back on some of that, and then we'll we'll go up, pick up from there. Yeah, and, and thanks for all the questions. So firstly, to Fina, um, it, it might be worth explaining that um, that there's one crucial difference to the way we're running this ballot to the way we've run them in the past and, it, and it, this would be helpful i think also um for for gordon and julie as well <coughs> when we've tried in the past and um we've got very close we've run a ballot and essentially what we've done is we've had one count and therefore unless we get over 50 percent across the whole of the board what it means is that we cannot take any action anywhere what we're doing this time, because when we looked at the consultative ballot, although Gordon's right, 45% of people voted overall, overall, actually 74 different employers smashed the 50% threshold and around 100 other employers got very close. And therefore the ballot this time, although it's a national ballot and we have national demands, the count of the ballot will be done employer by employer. And that means that any employer that we get over the 50% line can take industrial action. And we're very confident that we will get over the line in lots of employers. It means we're not running the risk of an all or nothing. If we do not get 50%, no one can do anything. And that in answer to, to Gordon um, and Julie really is shows you that what the leadership of the union has done this time is decided that we can't just keep our fingers crossed and hope this time, therefore we run the ballot in a way that does not mean it is an all or nothing one-off vote. 
So there will be, in a sense, at the same time, everybody will get a ballot paper at the same time, but there will be uh, a number, of, I think it's over 200 different counts of the ballots. And in answer, therefore, to Fina's question about the action, the minute we know where we have won the vote, that will allow the union to be very clear about where action can be taken. And the view of the executive is the first thing you do when you win the vote is obviously you're in a stronger position to negotiate with the government. They will know for the first time in years that the union can take industrial action at significant levels. So we will seek to talk to them to see whether or not that changes their mind. Um, if it doesn't, what we're going to plan and talk about, and at the moment, Fina, I can tell you that the, the executive is talking to reps at all levels of the union about where action could be taken that would have an immediate impact that the government couldn't ignore to ensure that rather than see this as a dispute where we have some one day strikes of everyone, that the action is meant to be as hard hitting as possible. And that means it'll be a combination of different forms of action. And it means that the union may well consider in some parts of the action paying strike pay to people who may be asked to come out for longer periods because of the impact that they have. And that we ask others to take various forms of action. So I hope, Fina, what you can see from this is we're not planning a dispute in the way that maybe we've had them in the many years gone by of just a series of one-day strikes. We're, we're planning action that the government um, can't ignore. And part of that is being conscious that with a very low paid membership, we want to make sure that we can take action that everybody is able to support in one way or another. To ask the Julie's question directly, if in an employer people do not get over the 50% threshold, it means we cannot take any form of industrial action, otherwise it would be outside the law. Um, and that is why this threshold is so critical. Um, and so what we need to do here is get over the 50% threshold in as many places as possible we're balloting. The more places we do that, the more options we have to take the hardest hitting forms of industrial action um, that we can. In, in terms of Michael's point, you know, clearly what we've not been able to persuade people to do up to now is get over half of them to vote in the ballot. The indicative ballot, in fairness, is one of the highest indicative ballots that there's been in any union. I mean, to give you an idea, some other unions had indicative ballots where the turnout was 15% or 20%. So our indicative vote was actually reasonably high. And there is a sort of history of people not taking the, participating in indicative votes as much as if it was the, the, the real thing. So we, we took some heart from that vote. A, because 45% voted, but as I've said earlier, because 74 different employers smashed the 50% and 100 more got very close. So it's given us a lot of information that makes us confident that this time round, we should be prepared to, to get there. Final question about why people don't vote. I mean, somebody made the point at a recent TUC meeting I went to that a lot of people are looking at the RMT and the Communication Workers Union, and obviously they've beaten the threshold. I think I should point out that the RMT did not beat the threshold in every company in which they balloted. They won in most of them, but not in every single one. So we're not unique. Our colleagues in the universities, they run a ballot and they had many over 50% and many didn't. So the, pro the problems we have are not unique to PCS. They, 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 they happen in a number of areas. And as the teaching unions pointed out, the, the postal workers have around 1500 workplaces in Britain. There are 22,000 schools. In the civil service alone, we have thousands of workplaces. Some of them are huge, some of them are small. And so when we have these ballots, we often rely on having a representative in the workplace who's prepared to try and get that vote out. Um, and we don't have representatives in every workplace in the UK. We have them in a lot, but not in all of them. So there are problems sometimes getting people to engage. We're confident that this time, however, just on the basis of people contacting the union, answering our surveys, people are so utterly appalled by the position that they're in, that people are joining the union. Our membership has started to increase. More people have talked about not just joining the union, but we're getting a lot of emails saying, how do I get involved? So all the signs are that it is so bad out there that I think people are beginning to look to the union to join it. So, you know, at the end of the day, I can assure you, we'll do everything we can at the center. There'll be lots of emails and circulars and events like this, but the real key to winning is having somebody in every workplace, whether you're a rep or not, being prepared to talk to colleagues, urge them to vote, urge them to join in, 
And just to remember that if we do do that and we get over the line, we can be every bit as strong a union industrially as unions like the RNT, because we have members who have the ability to cause real disruption and the government need to understand that. And that's why we need to win the votes to make sure that we can threaten it. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'm going to start with a few more solidarity messages. They're coming thick and fast. So, Scottish Government, Western Central Scotland, Karen Ann, Solidarity from National Statistics, Newport, Stratford Regional Centre, Dil, Dil Joshi, Solidarity to all, greetings. And then, um, oh, there's many, many more, uh, which, which we'll come back to. Solidarity from DWP Wirral, um, Solidarity from PCS DBLA, DWP South Shields, Revenue and Customs HQ London, MOJ Associated Offices, Steve West, Solidarity from PCS DWP Edinburgh Lothian and Borders, Jackie Hadfield, Solidarity from PCS Associated and, Associate and Retired Members, or ARMS in other words, and if we can support you in any way, please let us know. So that's a, ni a nice message to have. Um, and solidarity from Anil Kula on behalf of Black members in the Northern region. Okay, so there are lots and lots of questions, Mark, are we pleased to hear. So I, I think probably picking up where you left off, somebody saying, I think the RMT, the CWU and ASLEF have really caught people's attention and are making people see that trade unions are the only real opposition to the Tories at the moment. What can we do in PCS to do the same rather than have people thinking that we're all overpaid bureaucrats? So that's a really good question and, and one that I know Mark will be keen to answer. There's a very positive message here from Fina who says the PCS digital site is fab and more people need to get on and use that. So that's good to hear and, and obviously <coughs> we're encouraging every single member and rep to go on to PCS Digital and make sure your data is accurate. There's obviously uh, nothing more important than making sure that when the time comes to ballot, we're balloting the right people in the right locations, the information we give to the employer about the ballot has to be as accurate as we can make it. So it's really, really important that, that we, we use digital where, where we can and where people can. FINA also says that they're focusing on those who didn't vote last time round. The PCS digital site shows you this and you can easily then target those members that didn't vote last time, uh, sorry, identify those members that didn't vote last time and target them with your communications. And I think that's a, a really good bit of advice there, Fina. So thank you so much for that. Okay. Um Saeed says the, the rail union has been fantastic in its action and the union leader there is leading by example. We could all really take a leaf out of his book. So that's, uh, that's um, you know, a shout out to Mick Lynch, who, as we know, has been doing a great job in terms of, of the media. Um, Michael, I think we need to assess inactive members, members that only sign up in case they have a workplace issue. That's where the problem's coming from. And obviously that's something we need to discuss, isn't it? Because clearly, you know, we, we want everybody to join the union, but we want them to be active members of the union that engage and participate in what we're doing. Along similar lines, um, we have a lot of advocates in our branch. What could advocates be doing to help us get ready? So a little bit like the, the there's another question that's anonymous, actually, but it says we're eight weeks away from the start. And I don't know personally what I should be doing to get ready. Uh, I don't I'm not clear whether that's come from a rep or a member, but I think it would be quite good to have some ideas about the practical, quite straightforward things that we can all do to make sure that we're ballot ready. And then one more mark and then obviously I'll, um, I'll, I'll hand over to you to pick up some of this. Jane Broderick Fox says, we really all need to stick together on this now. We give 100% and get no thanks from HMPPS. So clearly that's somebody with, with first-hand experience of some of the difficulties taking place in HMPPS right now. And, it, and it, as Jane says, the importance of us all working together, sticking together, recognising that if we all work together to do this, we're all going to be stronger for it and we're going to be, have a better chance of being able to do something about some of the things that the government are throwing at us. So, Mark, I don't know if you'd like to respond to some of that. So there's the, the other union's point around what can we do to make sure that PCS is seen in a similar vein, but there are also those other questions that came up as well. Yeah, th well, thanks for everybody for those questions. So I really rattled through them quite quickly. Um, so I think everybody thinks that Mick Lynch and Eddie Dempsey and other people from the RNT have been doing an amazing job 
in the media getting across why the RMT are taking industrial action. So too is Dave Ward from the Communication Workers um, and Joe Grady from the UCU. The first thing to remember is the reason they're on the telly and in the newspapers and in a position to do that is because their members voted for action and did so over 50%. They weren't in the media and they weren't able to make their case before the action had taken place. And we know this is the case because the last time we took national strike action over the question of pensions, for example, if people look back, they will see that in the same way, myself, it was Janice Godrich at that time, and that it would be Fran now. We're on Newsnight, we're on the telly every day, we're on the radio, because it's the fact that members are able to take action. So the single best thing we can do to be able to put our case across is to make sure that we win these votes, because that is when people start to take us a lot more seriously. Now, even announcing the ballot has meant we've already had considerable amount of media coverage. And when Liz Truss came up with her regional pay proposals this week, we were one of the unions that was all over in 546 different media, media articles with PCS in. Um, and of course, Liz Truss would do those proposals overnight. So I can assure people that we've got brilliant case studies. We've got justice. We've got fabulous people who are able to speak to the media, both members or lay reps, as well as full-time officials. What the media need to realize is that we're gonna be taking action. So we've got plans for a press conference the day the ballot starts. We're getting a lot of media stories out there now. So I just want to assure people that we're getting all that ready. We're already getting some coverage, but what makes the difference or not is if they think there's gonna be a strike in, in truth. And that's the key thing we wanna do. In terms of the points that Fina made, and, and Fina's been making some great points, um, I'm really glad that um, Fina's really pleased with our digital work because we do have some fantastic digital tools available, but we don't have enough people using them. So in answer to one of the questions about what should I do, the first thing everybody should do is make sure people are registered on PCS Digital and are accessing on there some of the things that people will find to help you with this ballot. Because if we don't know what's going on, and one of the things at the moment, we're asking reps, for example, to talk to members about the ballot and then register on our digital tools that they've done so, it allows us to know how many members have been spoken to about the ballot. And we know that lots of people are doing work, but they don't put it on our digital tools. And if that's the case, we can't assess at the center where the work's being done, where it isn't, and we need to help and put more resources in. So it's really important that people try to use all our digital tools, register, access, where you'll find a mine of information and lots of people you can contact if you need any help. I think that's even more important, Fran, if I could just throw in at this point, that this week we've seen um, one major employer, oh, I won't name who they are, but one major employer uh, who has made it absolutely clear that they are already clamping down. They're going to start watching what reps are doing. They're going to try to stop us using official means of communicating to members, mm -hmm. and they're going to start getting difficult. And, and that's because they worry about us winning the ballot, and therefore they're going to make it as hard as possible. So if the employer is going to try and stop us talking to people, stopping our reps, having conversations, the ability to communicate with you digitally is going to be more important than, um, than ever before. It's great that Fina has mentioned focusing on those who didn't vote last time, because let's be honest, the people who are voting are voting for action in enormous numbers. You know, it, the, the indicative ballot we had and the last two statutory ballots it didn't quite get to 50% turnout, but the yes vote for action was 80, 90%. I mean, we are balloting in lots of places in the union at the moment, and I, and I should make this point, are winning disputes. Only in the last week, our private sector security guards in OCS working in the MOJ, who voted to take industrial action, voted massively to take industrial action, and without taking one minute strike action, the employer improved their pay offer, improved their conditions uh, of service, and ended up with a much better job offer than they had before the strike vote. So we can win these ballots and we win them all the time locally. We've never quite managed to get over the 50%. So we know that the people who are voting are likely to vote yes. So targeting those who didn't vote and speaking to them is really important. Now, somebody else uh, put that in terms of about, you know, the people who um, join the union just as an insurance policy. Well, look, obviously we want as many people to join the union as possible. And once they're in the union, at least we can make our arguments to them. 
uh, I think there is some evidence that more and more people re recognize that the threats to us are now so great that even people who've been reluctant in the past are now reconsidering their position. We know that many people are worried. They want to vote yes, but they're worried about losing money for going on strike, for example. And what, what we need to do is to reassure people. I mentioned at the beginning, we've got a fighting fund with three million pounds in it now nearly. We have raised money every month that what we're looking at doing is not calling action that only protests where people lose pay and they don't think there was any point in it. We are trying to organize action that is hard hitting and sustained. That probably means that we will try and make sure that we give some financial support for those members we asked to do that, but ask everybody else to pitch in and show their support when needed. In other words, what we need to persuade people is, is we can win. And that actually, if we don't get over the line, and if the people who've never voted before but are in the union abstain, abstaining is, is, is frankly worse than voting no, because an abstention undermines everything that we're all doing. So talk to people, try to persuade them. Uh, and I think if we focus on those who didn't vote before, I think that's a, that's a, a good way of, of, of doing it. Um, in terms of advocates uh, and the question about eight weeks to go, what should we be doing? I mean, there's a, there's a big list of what people should be doing. I, I, the first thing I would say is go on PCS Digital. We, we're putting on courses around the country at the moment. They're, they're called strike schools where we've had hundreds of people come to get trained as to what people can do practically. But in a nutshell, Fran, if you go on PCS Digital, you find lots of things. But the way I would sum it up, I think, is this. Make sure in your office, whether that you're in a workplace or you are working hybridly, that we have a union meeting either by calling a meeting in the office or, or arranging one online with Zoom. Every single branch of workplace should be trying to hold meetings to talk to members. That's a real practical thing. Every branch should have its own plan about how we're gonna contact members, how we're gonna communicate with them. We need every branch, as you pointed out at the beginning, Fran, to make sure that the records we have for members are accurate. This is a postal vote. And for anyone who's wondering, the reason it's postal is because the law of the land does not allow us to do this by email. You can elect the prime minister by email, allegedly. You can vote in virtually any other democracy or any other decision, but you're not allowed in Britain to vote for a strike unless you do it by post. That's deliberate to make it harder. So wherever your address is registered, that's where your ballot paper will go. So we need people immediately to check that we've got the right personal details for you. We've got the right contact details. If you're not a rep, if you're an advocate or you're just a member who wants to get involved, find your local rep. If you can't find out who they are, go on our website or on, on our systems and we'll find somebody who will be able to tell you that is, talk to them and see if there's any ways that you can help. Because I think if we have a meeting, we issue a communication, we start talking to people, particularly those people who don't vote, we can smash the threshold. And those are some practical things I think that we can be doing. Um, and finally, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll say this, is if wherever you are, whatever office you're in or whatever branch you're in, if you want to organize a meeting and ask for a union speaker to come, either from your group or from the National Executive Committee, let us know and we will do everything we can to come to your location and hold a meeting, either in your office or workplace, or if there's enough in one town, or if, you, if you're in a multi-employer building, we'll come and try and arrange PCS meetings for members. And so those are some ideas of what people can do. Um, but at the end of the day, if you want to know more than that, just drop us a line, an email, or give us your details in the chat, and somebody will contact you after this call tonight to run through that in some in more practical detail. Okay, thanks so much, Mark. Okay, so a few more questions here. Uh, Sabine says, we really need to focus on branches with low turnout in the past. There's obviously something going wrong there. It seems to be always the same branches that hit the 50%. What are the leadership plans on this, please? And obviously that will differ by group or department and it'll differ depending where it is you work. But the more of us that work together on this, the better chance we've got of, of, of you know, doing a good job, isn't it? Marianne says, as there's nothing to stop us using departmental systems to encourage our members to update their details, the first part of our brand plan that we're working on now is Teams messaging all 1,800 of our members to ask them to sign up for digital and update their own records. It's hard work, but it's been really worthwhile. And I think that is a really good tip. You know, people are wondering what they can do. Um, that's one, 
doing that in your own branch, making sure that your members uh, have got their details up to date is, is invaluable in, in terms of all of this. Um, Michael says, I think we need to assess inactive members, members that only sign up. I think I may have read that before, but um, there are a number of messages in the same vein about people who join the union and then don't vote. Uh, Keith Crane says, it's going really well in DEFRA London and South East. Massive recruitment, more reps, more members, and, and members be have been contacted to update their PCS details every day. Three more advocates, three more became advocates today after our meeting with 164 members there, which is 20% of our branch. Much more to do though. So uh, as Keith acknowledges, whilst there's more to do, what a great start that is. And, and the fact that, you know, all, all of those people came forward to get more involved. I mean, I did a a meeting here in London in Whitehall this morning with a, with a, lots of people that were brand new to union activity and the enthusiasm and the discussions we had about the things that can be done. I mean, for, for those that are saying <coughs> the 26th of September seems a little way off, when you put it into the context of the data cleanse that needs to take place in the next four weeks and the work that needs to take place in every branch between now and the 26th of September, it'll come pretty fast. So um, that that's really good that people like Keith are holding those meetings and getting good outcomes. Uh, Claire, we, we need to get your top people to visit sites to encourage those who are worried about strike action and the backlash that they feel they will get. So this thing about giving people confidence, isn't it? <coughs> Letting people know that there's something they can do. Caroline, do you think people will vote to strike if they are already struggling financially? People are already saying they can't afford to strike. So we need to, to counter that, don't we? Um, and Yes, so, so Claire makes a very similar point. Uh, Dylan says grades need to be correct on digital too. It's very important that we, we're giving the right data to the employer. So it's not just about making sure you've got an up-to-date mobile email address, postal address. Have we got the correct grade for you? Because clearly when somebody gets promoted, it's probably not the first thing they think of doing is getting in touch with PCS and asking us to change their grade. So we, we've probably got a bit of work to do there. And Mary says the Government are saving money by closing offices and through hybrid working, but we get nothing but an email to say thank you. Thank you doesn't put food on our tables. Uh, Tracy says this is not a drill. Vital that details are correct on PCS Digital and that people return their ballot papers. Mark, I'm going to pause there because I recognise there's an awful lot for you to come back on. Do you want to come back on some of that and then, and then we'll see where we are? Yeah, I will, yeah. And, and again, thanks for all these questions. And it's really encouraging, not just hearing the questions, but hearing some of the some of the fantastic work that's going on. So um, starting with Sabine, um, we are focusing on branches where the turnout was low. So just to, to let people know that obviously the union is organized um, into employer groups and wherever you work, you'll have elected leaders um, uh, on your executive committees. So every group in the union has been asked to produce its own plan for its particular employer group to ensure that we maximize the turnout and people have got the turnout in every branch. We know where we need to be targeting and where we need to, to get in. And that picture, I just want to say here, is actually quite encouraging. I'm just going to give you an example. In our two biggest groups, the DWP and HMRC, where in the indicative vote, we didn't get to the 50%. We got around about the national average. When we've broken it down, the amount of extra votes we need is tiny. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a couple of thousand. It breaks down, I think, in some cases to about 30 extra votes per branch. So these numbers are small. And targeting efforts and resources is, is really important. So I just want to reassure people we are looking at each branch and we are looking about where we can make the difference to get over the line. Uh, like you, I think Marianne's point about the team's messaging is a really good one. I mean, if people can do that, they should. I mean, just flagging up, we know already one employer who's put something out to HR managers telling them to go the other way and to start trying to clamp down a bit. So if people can do this now, let's do what we can do. Um, and as someone said, it's not a drill, that's absolutely true. And it's not the sexiest thing in the world, but if we haven't got the right contact details for people, it makes it much harder to win. So the work we do now, between now and the 3rd of September, I think is really important. Great to hear what Keith Crane told us. I mean, if there's been a members meeting of 164 and we've got more people coming forward, what a fantastic example. Now I'm guessing at Keith's meeting, what that tells us, if that meeting is that large, 
is because what we know is members are suffering, aren't they? They're suffering with poverty pay, worried about their pensions, worried about their jobs, and they can see other unions are beginning to do something. So it's great. And what we need is more meetings like that. So well done, Keith. And, and, I'm, and I hope we'll get lots of reports of other people doing the same. On the point about top people to visit sites, I'll just reiterate the point. If, if anyone here is in a, in a place where you think you would benefit from having someone from the National Union or from your group coming to try and organize a members meeting, just let us know. We, we will try to get speakers out wherever we can. And if we, if we can, we will come to towns and cities and try to organize people from different branches coming together if needs be. So, you know, we do understand that sometimes people do get more confident if they can be reassured. I just want to reassure people here that we have a lawful right to strike. Nobody can have anything done to them if they vote to take part in industrial action. And on the point about people worried about the money, that what we have to work out here is if we're not successful in this campaign, and what we know is at the end of this year, in real terms, you will have 9% less money in your purse or in your wallet than you had at the start of the year for doing the same work. I mean, that's catastrophic and it's going to get worse. We know you'll carry on overpaying for your pensions and we know that one in five of the jobs where you work will go. So even though people worry about being able to afford to strike, the other side of that coin is we really can't afford not to because if we aren't able to stop them, things are going to get so much worse for so many more people. However, I also want to reassure people, because we have a union with a lot of low paid members in, the action we want to take is designed to put the maximum amount of pressure on. And whilst we will want all members to show their support, we do see that we have some parts of this union that are in a very strong position. And I can assure you that we will be weighing that up very carefully about making sure the action we take is effective to ensure we can win um, as quickly um, as, as possible. Dylan makes a great point about grades um, because, because Dylan's right. When we have to notify the employer, we have to tell them uh, how many members that we've got, where they work and what their grades are. Um, I'll just remind people that recently the train drivers who were getting turnouts, by the way, of 80, 90% with strike votes of 90%, the employer went to court in one case and forced them to reballot, literally because one of the workplaces had changed its name within the last year, and therefore the name given to the workplace was wrong. It tells you that they will look for any technicality. And so the importance of having your up-to-date grade and details is, is absolutely um, really important. And, and finally, to Mary and others at the end, from I just want to echo the point that you, is that, you know, if not now, when really, th this really is it. We have to stick together. And whether you work in the biggest government departments or whether you work in a small employer, if we win the ballot in your employer and we win across enough, we are absolutely convinced that we can force the government to give us more. Absolutely convinced. The thing they're relying on is that we won't win. Um, and what we have to make sure is that we do win. And here's a thought just to finish this round of questions on, Fran. Anyone who saw Jacob Bruce mogg uh, uh, when he, when, before Liz Trust did a U-turn on her proposals, Jacob Bruce mogg went on the TV and said, this policy is reasonable because civil servants working in areas where the pay is poorer, i.e. the North or the Southwest, they should be paid less because it's not fair on the private sector who have to compete with our high wages. Now, that is what Jacob rees said. Now, that's rubbish on so many levels. But if you just take it at what he meant, what he means is he thinks we should be driven down our pay levels on the basis of, of where you live to the lowest pay rates. It gives us an idea that what they're doing to us at the moment isn't where they want to stop. They want to go much further. And the only way we'll win now and stop them doing worse things to us, if Liz Truss or whoever wins, is them realising that the union can take action that they can't ignore. And that's ultimately our massive challenge that we believe we can do between now and the ballot in September. OK, thanks so much, Mark. Again, um, covered a lot of ground there, uh, but they're still coming thick and fast, so we'll keep going. Uh, Elizabeth says, myself and the other reps working really hard in Glasgow, engaging with members and checking that all contact details are up to date. Well, well done to you, Elizabeth, because, I mean, there's nothing more valuable than doing that at the moment. Uh, Melfin, uh, I, I can probably deal with this Melfin 
quite quickly. Is it 50% of all workers or 50% of union members? It's 50% of those balloted. So if you if you think about people, only only union members receive a ballot paper, and we must must have returned more than 50% of those ballot papers issued. Okay, um, Andy, the public are generally on the side of the RMT, but we won't get that sort of support. Uh, so that's something you might want to come back on. There are a couple of comments from someone called Michael, who I'm assuming is the same person. So I'll, I'll read them together. Uh, why are we not? It, it may be Michael that you posted this before Mark covered this in some detail, but why are we not doing something now? Strike while the iron's hot. Every other public department except for us is doing this now and winning. Um, and then how will you be working across different unions in workplaces? In DEFA, we have a few, so it would be good to know what is being done on that front. Um, and then Dananjay says, HMRC members have just received their final pay rise of their three-year deal. What would be the best argument to persuade members there to vote so that we do get over the threshold? Um, and then just re I'll read this out. It's not really a question. It's more of a statement. But Liz Noonan says, if there's no 50 percent, I'm prepared to do absolutely any other type of action that we can do. But unfortunately, Liz, that that anti-trade union legislation that we've talked about does prevent that action without the 50 percent, which is why it's so important. Mark, do you want to cover off some of what I've just I've just read out? There's quite a lot there. Uh, and then we'll go again. Yeah, thanks very much. So, so firstly, big thank you to Elizabeth then and all Elizabeth's colleagues who's doing the business up in Glasgow, I think it was. Um, and obviously, if we get more of that going on everywhere, then we, we will smash it. Um, Andy said the public won't support us. So if you think about the, the public support in the RMT, uh, it's unusual that the public uh, support in the way that has been demonstrated strikes and inconvenience them so much. And actually, the reason for that is almost certainly because most members of the public empathise because they also, whether in a union or not, and whether on strike or not, understand the cost of living crisis, understand that it's never been this bad and it's fair that somebody does something about it. So personally, I think we're going to get massive support when we take action. And what we can judge it by is where we've had strikes in this union over the last couple of years we've had incredible support at the dvla in swansea where we were on strike for months where we knew it had an incredible effect in terms of driving licenses we still got massive amount of support both in terms of politicians and the public um, so we will be out there arguing for every bit of support and I, i'm personally convinced that we will get it just to answer, Michael, why not now everyone else is doing it? Well, well, firstly, to be clear, everyone else isn't doing it. Most of the unions in our sector, the public sector, have either not balloted yet um, or are planning to ballot at the same time as us. I have spoken to the teachers, to the fire brigades union, to Unison in both health and local government and to the other civil service unions. Um, and our ballot is currently either before everybody else's or it will be at the same time. So in the public sector, we're in exactly the same time frame, if not a bit before some of the others. The people who are ahead of us, the RMT, the CWU, the UCU, obviously in their employers, things happened that meant they needed to go now. Our judgment when we talked about it was knowing how important it is to win was that we needed to give ourselves the time to do the work and we needed to ensure that we will win the ballots and hopefully we'll be in a position to take action alongside other public sector colleagues. So that, that's the reason why we've done it. And, and to be honest, if we balloted earlier and not won the ballot, that would have been the end of it. And I think our view is it's better to have taken a bit more time to give us a better chance to win than to just go ahead of everybody else in the public sector and take that risk. But I would also just say to Michael that it wasn't the NEC who made this decision. Actually, there was a debate at the union's conference in May where reps come from every branch in the union. And there was a proposal to ballot in July and one in September. And the proposal to ballot in July got hardly any votes at all, precisely, I think, because most reps realised we did need the time to make sure that we actually won. I've mentioned about joint working with other unions. And, and, and just to give people some more good news, not only are we talking to our other public sector colleagues, we've proposed to the TUC and it's been accepted and there will be a meeting on the 5th of September for the first time ever 
where all unions, both public and private, who are either taking action or are planning to take action, will meet together in order to coordinate. That is a huge step forward. And the reason that's important for us is we don't just want our action, you know, obviously, if we have to take it on our own, we will. But we, we want that action to be with other public sector colleagues, but also with people in the private sector that we can make common cause with. So if you think about it, recently baggage handlers, big publicity, the baggage handlers at Heathrow were going on strike. Well, PCS has members at Heathrow, whether it's passport checkers, people in the border force, people in air traffic control. And therefore, it's right that we know what private sector colleagues are doing to see whether there could be some coordination in the transport sector. In the justice sector, for example, barristers are on strike at the moment. And so we are talking to them about how we could work together with our MOJ members. And that goes across the board. And we, so we're having those discussions now. Um, finally, on uh, the HMRC point, and I'm glad this point's come up. HMRC have just had their final payoff for this year, and it is better than most other people will have had. Um, it's 5% for a lot of people, but that is half the rate of inflation. And so the argument in HMRC applies the same there as to anyone else, is that if we win this ballot, we're asking for 10% this year. If we are successful, everyone in HMRC should get more money. But everyone in HMRC also is affected by the 2% overpayment in pensions. If we win on that, the average PCS member will have £500 a year backdated to April 2019 and ongoing an extra 2% a month in your pay packet. Also in HMRC, it's one of those departments that the consequence of losing 20% of your workforce and potentially on reduced redundancy pay doesn't bear thinking about. We, we know in HMRC and DWP and other big departments, the idea of losing one in five, it's already stressful enough now trying to do the work we're asked to do. Doing it with one job in five gone is unimaginable. So whether you're in HMRC, DWP, or you're in a small arm's length body, the argument is the same. You all need more money, you all need your pensions back, and you all need job security. And everybody, therefore, would benefit if we could win these demands from the government. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. OK, so uh, I'm going to start off with a couple of statements because I think they're quite they're quite good ones to read out. Claire, I know we are struggling with bills and it's not winter yet, but I'd rather eat beans than let them get away with this. I do understand it would make a difference to me losing pay, but it's still worth it. And Heather, three months of my take home pay is my gas and electric bill for the year. We have to have more money. Um, and I think those two statements read together just sum up the scale of what we're facing, don't we? Um, Mick, these pe those people who don't engage can't possibly be happy with the pittance of pay that we get. The union is only as strong as the people in it. So pull your finger out, vote for industrial action now, and let's beat this government. I think Mick, that's, that sums it up very nicely. Uh, Jen? Hi, I'm still quite a newbie to the DWP. Just wondering if there's any talk of strike pay or hardship funds. I think it's going to be the hardest part to overcome if people are already struggling to pay their bills and they're skint and they're scared. Um, but Jen's then posted. But as soon as I posted that, Mark started talking about the hardship fund. So uh, you, you, I think you partially answered that question, Mark. Um, Amel, uh, Amelie says, I think, we, I think we need to highlight to our members that if trust cuts our facility time, we will not be able to assist them. And that is really concerning. And, you know, people will have seen the bold statements from Liz Trust, but, you know, whether it's her or Sunak that wins the, the Tory leadership election, there's no doubt that both will be coming for, for us and for public sector workers more generally. Uh, Gareth, what action will be taken against departments that are in the middle of a multi-year deal? I think Mark partially covered that with the, with the HMRC answer, because clearly, you know, there, there are there are other issues that were balanced. You know, it's not just about pay. Clearly, the pensions and the job cuts as well. Um, Adalia, I am an interim. And I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to strike. Um, I think possibly if you want to message our our team whilst the call's going on, Adalia, we, we will um, look into that for you in terms of where you work. Because obviously you haven't put that in the message. But if you let us know where, where you work and on, on what contract you're employed, we can, we can obviously give you some advice about that. Megan, are agency workers allowed to strike? Um, and Claire saying... 
Can you imagine the message it sends if these, to these rotten Tories if after everything they've thrown at us, we can't get the 50% vote? We have to do something to get members voting. We have to do whatever it takes. So uh, I, I think, Claire, that's a, a really well, well, well articulated message and, and very clear. Uh, Paul, as an A1 in CPS, the lowest grade, unfortunately. I'm having to request help from a charity for civil servants, again, just in order to be able to fill my car to get to work. And I think that, Paul, that sums up why this campaign is so important. Um, and then I will call, call you back in a minute, Mark, because I, I recognise that I'm throwing questions at you thick and fast here. But Adrienne says, um, possibly too long, po I'm not very clear on the question. It's not very clear, but postal ballot members will complete the vote, but will they put it in the post box? My branch is actively updating members' information. And a couple, just as an aside, a couple of meetings I've done just recently, people have pointed out that the number of ballot papers that are returned no longer at this address or the, the address is not up to date would probably be the difference between getting getting us over the line and not so it, where, where ballot papers don't even reach the individuals so any work people can do now in terms of making sure that ballot data is up to date is really important i'm going to end on this one mark because i think it will fit in quite nicely with some of the other answers eileen says could we have a post box in the office to collect the ballot papers with um and i know that's been discussed before so i don't know are you able to come back on some of that Yes. Um, <laughs> um, again, look, thank and you know, going right back to starting yeah. to Heather and to Claire right at the beginning, and, and others who said it. Look, I, I think those words are very powerful. The survey of members I mentioned at the beginning is heartbreaking when you actually go through the responses. We all know what's at stake, and, and we all know um, that if we don't get over the line, that's it. What the government's planning, they're going to get away with, um, and therefore. The minute we get over the line, the whole balance shifts because then they know we can do something. Then we'll have a more serious conversation. And if needs be, we'll start taking the action that will show them. And I, I do just want to just make a point here that what I really want everybody to understand is we absolutely believe that if we win the ballot in enough of our employers, the action we can take can win. And we know that because we are winning all of the time. And we've had some disputes in the union, and one that springs to mind is our driving examiner members, where they voted to take industrial action. Um, we had mass meetings on Zoom. Government made a last minute offer to try to stop the action going ahead. Members rejected it as not enough. And by the following morning, we more or less got exactly what we were asking for without action taking place. So the minute you, you can go into the room and say we can now take action A, B, C, D, E, and this is what it will be, the whole nature of the conversation changes. But for all those who've said it, um, like Claire said it towards the end there, if we don't get over the line, then it doesn't bear thinking about, uh, because what they're planning is what they'll get away with. So there is so much at stake, um, and I think that's really coming across really well. It's obviously a recurring theme here about people worrying about being affording to go on strike. And it, and it is that old dilemma, isn't it? If we don't go on strike, they get away with it and people get in a worse position every year. If we do go on strike, we know that we can win, but people worry about being affordable. Now, I keep reassuring people that the action we want to call needs to be a mix of A, showing them that everybody supports what we're doing, but B, focuses on where we really can hit them and hit them hard. And that's where there'll be this combination of looking at how you can use hardship payments or strike pay with the combination of everybody showing that they support them. The union cannot pay strike pay if we've got 150,000 members on strike uh, because we would never have the money to do it. The union can pay strike pay where there are small amounts of members on strike and maybe others are doing things periodically, including perhaps chipping in some money to help support those who are taking action. So there's a variety of tactics that we can use what I want to assure people is, is that the NEC is very well aware of the financial pressures on people and the fact that we're not just protesting that we need for them to realise we can win. If It stands to reason as well that if other unions are taking action at the same time as us, then again what we're doing could be done 
in combination with other unions at the same time or sequencing action so that the joint effect of everybody doing something over a period of time is much more powerful. So I want to just reassure people, we understand people's financial predicament, but in the first instance, we have to win the vote. And I think that's the, that's the thing really that we, we definitely want to focus on now. I know there's been quite a lot of comments about multi-year deals and group pay awards. So the, the, the simplest way I'd put it is, any multi-year deal that has been done with this union over the past few years, when it was done, nobody could have even imagined inflation would be between nine and 11%. So 5% may have looked really great three years ago when inflation was probably 2%. It doesn't look so great now that it's 11%. So the point is whatever group arrangements are in place, have been under a diktat of the Treasury's pay remit of 2% average awards. If we got the government to concede that there should be a 10% pay rise for the civil service, we want that to apply everywhere, irrespective of whether people are in multi-year deals. If, if we can force them to give more money, that money should be distributed out across all of our members who are uh, in the different employer groups. So it's important that people realize whatever deals have been done, that was before this ballot and before a dispute and before inflation reached this target. So everybody stands um, to benefit. And that, that's the way that I, I would look at it. And um, don't worry about what you may have had or may not have had in your employer. The game changes if we get over the line. And that is for everyone. Everyone deserves 10% in our view, um, everybody. And everybody deserves a minimum wage of £15 um, an hour. On the agency workers, Obviously, again, that it would help if the person asking that question gave us more details, because what I just want to stress here is that the ballot we're holding is essentially for people who are covered by either the cost of living, pay issue, civil service pension, job cuts or redundancy. But we know we've got lots of members who are not employed by the civil service, some of them by private contractors, some of them on different conditions, they're agency workers in some cases, Talk to your rep or ask us because we are encouraging anyone else to consider trying to trigger their own ballot at the same time as we're doing this to ensure as many people as possible can take place. And whether that is appropriate to the person asking the question, we can't say here without knowing more details, but it's definitely worth people asking. And we, we want to ensure that where we have membership, uh, people can also be balloted where, we, where that can be done. Um, in terms of the post box question, uh, the law is very tricky on this, and um, uh, it tells us that there should be no interference between the member receiving the ballot paper and the member returning it. And therefore, what you can't rule out is that if we had a, a situation where everybody went to one central point and then we went away and posted it, that could be challenged. Um, what can't be challenged, I don't think, is if members were all gathering together at a post box and they were posting them themselves and we took pictures. I think that's fair enough. And I think if you wanted to show people that you're voting and we, we could, you know, we can we can try and find ways of people doing it collectively. But the law is so tight that if you were to give your ballot paper to anyone else, potentially an employer might, might try to challenge it. So there's other ways, though, that we can try and show some form of um, uh, collective sort of solidarity. So I hope that's dealt with um, most of the points. And I know you said to Adelia, I think, again, about the, in I think she said, described this as an intern, again, to give us the details and we we'll get back into that. That's great. Thank you. OK, um, there's a couple that I can probably pick up, Mark. Um, Marie says, who is the ballot aimed at? Not see much about DWP. You won't see anything about DWP via the employer systems because clearly the, the the rules that exist prevent us from mentioning industrial action on the DWP email system. What I would say, Marie, is make sure your your contact details, your personal contact details, are up to date with us at PCS, and make sure we've got your home email address because we are churning material out around this campaign and around the issues that affect DDP members. But clearly, that can't be sent, or a lot of it can't be sent via workplace email. But um, visit our website as well, where there'll be lots more information around that. And then. Uh, Stacy says, when do we get to vote and how? Um, I think Mark did cover that. So we get to vote from the 26th of September when the ballot opens, six week ballot period. And because of the anti-trade union legislation that's in place, we can only vote postally. 
So it's not enough to press a button or uh, to, to vote digitally. We, we all have to vote postally by putting a cross in the box, sticking it in an envelope and taking it to the nearest letterbox. So that's something that obviously we can all hopefully do and we need to make sure we do. Uh, there's, we're getting near the end, Mark, you'll be pleased to hear. Uh, Bernie says, so can I use Teams to remind my colleagues, even though I'm not a rep, I'm just a member. Um, and that member actually comes from my branch. And Bernie, there are lots of ways we can we can work with you. We, we've got a lot of members to cover, haven't we? So anybody uh, can use Teams. And obviously, if you've got contacts um, in, in your branch or in neighbouring branches, by all means, then Teams, you know, as long as you careful about what what you say there's no reason why you can't ask members to keep their contact information up to date okay so chris says if the ballot is successful then non-union members need to be educated about their right to strike i'm amazed how many colleagues believe that they can't strike because they aren't in the union uh, somebody else who's anonymous says membership in EFRA group is up 14% in 2022. Half of our branches have had members meetings on pay and they are averaging 20% attendance and we're having really good conversations with our members. The EFRA GC already has suggestions for more communications to get out. So that's, that's good to hear. Uh, Cathy says we're glad to see the PCS leadership making such an effort to speak to reps and members like tonight as it helps keep motivation going during what can be a really stressful and long time leading up to the ballot. Uh, in a similar vein, Simon says, I need to pop off now, but as a member, this has been great. I'll be contacting my rep this week to ask to be an advocate and chatting to my team about all joining the union. Let's get ourselves across that line in solidarity, Simon. And I think that's a, a great message. I know Simon's probably left by now, but uh, I think it's really good that he took the time to send that message. Uh, Lisa says, I don't know if this has already been asked so apologies if it has but how in terms of equality is it fair that senior civil servants got such a higher pay increase than those at the lower pay bands uh, Sarah says I went to the BT open reach picket line in Salford on Monday and there was a lot of support from passing traffic I think strikes are popular at the moment because everyone needs a pay rise and when we're on strike we can ask for that same solidarity and for solidarity money from other unions who are not on strike our trade union have a strong our trade unions have a long and strong tradition of supporting each other so thank you for that Sarah I mean a number of us were on the RMT picket line in Leeds last week and they were very quick to say that they were so grateful for the solidarity that had been shown by PCS members and that they would be doing the same for us the minute we are in a position to take our own action so as you say we have a strong tradition don't we of, of unions supporting each other and that solidarity is really important and Tom says hopefully this call has galvanized everybody on it to advocate, whether they're an advocate or a rep, to get out and make sure we don't just get 50%, but actually we get closer to 70 or 80%. And Tom, I think that's probably a great comment. That's the last comment. I've got the only other comment somebody posted was, are we allowed to leaflet our members? Um, and by leafleting, clearly they mean standing outside the workplace, handing out leaflets as people go into work. So Mark, do you want to have one last go at that, that last round of questions? and then I think we are getting near to the end there. Brilliant. Okay, so again, it's great to hear so many fantastic things that are already, um, already going on. Um, and big thanks to everybody who's, who said that and great messages from Cathy and from Simon and from others. Um, Sarah was saying about the BT picket line. And I think that just echoes the point. Our experience is wherever anybody's taking action at the minute, it is getting better reception than any other time. And I think that's because poverty and hardship is being felt by so many people across, you know, across the country. I have no doubt that if we take action, we will get massive support. I also have no doubt that what we do, I mean, we, we keep asking ourselves, what are others doing? They also look to us. And, and I can tell you that when I talk to the leaders of the teachers unions, and the teachers unions are likely to be balloting for industrial action around about just as our ballot is coming to a close. And one of the things they said to me is they've got a big job. They've got 22,000 schools. They've got to get over the line. And they said the effect of us winning would really galvanize support for teachers. Yeah. 
They also made the point that if we didn't win, teachers who are being offered 5% would ask themselves, well, if our colleagues in the civil service and related areas are getting 2% and 90,000 job cuts and pensions robbery, and they didn't vote for action, it makes it harder. So what we need to understand is that PCS, we, we try as hard as anyone else um, and everybody has similar problems to us. We're very good at some things, others are better at others. The point is, is that all unions go through what we're going through. But the effect of us winning doesn't just strengthen our position, it makes it more likely that those teachers will win and that the government finds it harder and harder to withstand. So all roads lead to Rome, really, Fran, don't they? That every single person who's spoken tonight all understands that if we get over the threshold, and I agree with a colleague who said it'd be nice to have 70 or 80 percent, fantastic. But if we get over the threshold, we're in the game and we're at the table and we can win. If we don't, then we're in a worse position than anywhere else. And so whatever we do, that's what our focus really needs to be. So it's great to hear about EFRA. If membership is at 14 percent. We're averaging 20 percent attendance of meetings. That's great because the, the ones who aren't at the meetings will be hearing about those meetings probably then joining the union. So it's, it's, it's one of those old things, isn't it? If people see any activity at all, it'll make people realize that things are happening. So to the person asking, can we leaflet? Yes, we can leaflet. And wherever you work, if you're just a member, a rep or an advocate, or talk to colleagues, but having leafleting going on in workplaces and outside is a really good thing. It shows visibility and it shows that the union is there. And if people need help, if you're in a really big place, you know, particularly if you're in a workplace where there may be four or five different employers, for example, just imagine if we got colleagues from other employers in the same building leafleting with us, it would really show lots of people coming together. So those things really, really help. Um, you answered the what and how, and I, I, all I would add um, to, the, to the question, the ballot papers will go out on the 26th of September. Um, if you have not had a ballot paper after two or three days after the 26th of September, don't just sit and wonder, ask someone or email us or contact us. Because if this was an email ballot, the minute you tell us, we can send you an email and it can be sorted. This whole postal thing, they design it to make it as hard as possible. So if your ballot paper has been lost or it's gone to the wrong address, you have to tell us and have to order another one and we have to make arrangements to send it to you. All of that takes a bit of time. So if you haven't had a ballot paper, ask someone. Ask a colleague if they had their ballot paper, ask them if they voted. Don't be afraid to mention, and I agree with Chris, non-members are entitled to take industrial action. It would be better though if those non-members joined the union. And, uh, and I think therefore, you know, now is a good time to mention to people who may not have joined before. People may have been skeptical about unions, but if they're not in a union, they'll still be struggling to pay their bills. They'll still be overpaying for their pension. And if they can now be open to the argument about come and join us, what better time to ask people, even ones who've, who've, who've never joined um, before. On the equality point, I mean, I mean it is a really good point, that, that it, is, it is unconscionable that some employers have sought to give bigger pay awards to the more senior staff rather than the people that, in the more junior grades. I mean, that is appalling. Um, it's, it's, it's not justifiable um, and in a way where if that is happening anywhere I think it goes to show the unfairness in the systems themselves we believe that all our members deserve a 10% pay rise and a minimum of £15 a week and other things to, to make our terms and conditions better the government wants you to have 2% and so what we can see from that is that the only way to bridge that gap is the government feeling that we can force them to do more so I'm going to just finish, um, I think, on this point, Fran. We, we will shortly be sending weekly emails out to our reps to, to remind people what it is that they can be doing. We want anyone who's been on the call tonight to think afterwards, hopefully you enjoyed the meeting, you found it informative, talk to someone tomorrow, contact us to see what you can do. Some of the ballots, we fall short by literally handfuls of votes. You could have a conversation with three people. You could persuade three people in your office to vote, and that literally could make the difference between getting over the line or not in your employer. So every act helps. An individual act of talking to one person makes a difference. If you called a meeting and got 50 people to come to a meeting, then obviously that's even more significant. Lots of people will be probably wanting to help. 
and we've just got to try and do whatever we can. And whether you are in, you know, the tip of Scotland, in the southwest of England, whether you're in Northern Ireland, Wales, or anywhere in this country, wherever you work, every vote matters. And my very final point is to think of it this way as well. Given the way that we're running the ballot, and given that we need to win in each employer, it's also important to remember that where you work, your vote has another effect. If in your employer you get over the line on this ballot, you're sending your employer a very clear message. We're sending the government a message, but your employer will know that PCS, where you work, has got over the threshold, and that means the union is strong. And there will be other issues coming down the track in, in time to come where the strength of the union may make a difference. It might be a local issue for you. It may be an employer-based issue. The more places we win, the stronger message we send your employer as well as the government. So I'll leave it there, Fran. I'm really grateful for everyone to be on. We will do more of these coming up. We will be doing the emails. There's lots of ways people can get involved. But please check your details. Talk to your colleagues. Get involved. And let's remember that when we get to the autumn, if we win the votes, we can win the campaign. If we do not get over the threshold, we will lose. The stakes are higher than ever before. Let's not entertain losing. Let's smash the threshold and smash the yes vote, and then we can win. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. And I think that's a really good note to finish on. Just a couple of closing remarks from me. Can I just say that if you take nothing else away from tonight, hopefully people have found it interesting and informative. If you find it useful, uh, and we, we can do more of this, this sort of thing as, the, as time goes on throughout the, the weeks ahead. So we can, we can have further Facebook Live events like this one. But one thing to reiterate, is that we really do need to maximize the use of PCS Digital. It's all well and good telling people that you're doing a lot of work, but if it's not recorded on digital, that um, to make sure that we've spoken to our members and our members' information is up to date, that's the only method PCS have got of, make, of monitoring those people who've told us that, that, that their data is accurate. And why, you know, hopefully the last hour and a half has stressed why that is so important. So the, the, it's really, really simple now to access PCS Digital. There's lots and lots of support and information on the website available about exactly how you do that. But just go on there, check that your, your email and your mobile number is up to date. But more importantly, check that we've got the correct postal address for you. Because what we don't want to do is fall at the first hurdle and people not even receive a ballot paper. As Mark said, it's much, much more difficult with a postal ballot to get a replacement. It has to be posted out as, a, as opposed to just being able to press a button. So I would really urge you all to do all you can. Let's let's work together on this because I think we can all agree, whatever our views on on some of the individual issues, that we're stronger when, when we work together. And we, we need to give ourselves, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our members to give ourselves the best chance of defeating some of these proposals from government and pushing back and making sure that we're in the position to be able to do something about them. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks for everybody that asked a question. I hope we got through pretty much all of them, I think, um, that, that, that came to me. Um, if there was anything that we missed, if, if for any reason you, you felt something you asked wasn't fully addressed, you can always uh, contact, contact uh, the, the, the the chat group there and post something in there and we'll make sure that all of that is followed up but thank you very much take care enjoy the rest of your evening and let's let's do what we can for the 26th of september thank you and good night <laughs>